Welcome to the Disrupting Obesity Podcast. I'm Charlotte Skeins, and I'll be sharing ways to regain control over your body and lose an extreme amount of weight naturally. Being fat is about so much more than just the food. It's about your relationship with food. That means that dealing with your weight is about more than just the food too. You have to change that relationship. You have to start disrupting obesity. Last week, I kicked off our nine episodes of nine with the nine things I wish I'd known before I started losing my weight. This week, we're doing my nine favorite tips. Some of these would qualify as things I wish I'd known too, just like how there were several things on last week's list that could have made it onto this week's list. I'm really excited about this series of episodes, and I hope that you are too. More than anything, I hope you find them helpful. Um, All right, these are turning into my longest episodes, so we should probably get going. First up is the 20-minute rule. I learned about this one right around the halfway mark when I lost weight the first time, and it helped me with my perspective and my mindset more than just about anything else. It came at a really critical point for me because, yeah, I was down 100 pounds. I also still had 100 pounds to go, and losing that first 100 wasn't exactly easy. I hadn't hit my stride. Like it took me a while to get the calorie piece figured out. The intermittent fasting part was very intuitive and I found it easy to stick with. Um, That part wasn't a struggle for me, even though I didn't start eating until six at night. My body was on board, right? It really liked the new schedule and I was into it mentally too. It was the calories that took longer. Sorting out the calories though was made a whole lot easier by this tip. And it was one of the most helpful things with the intuitive side too, because I didn't intuitively know how to listen to my body anymore. After years of overeating and binge eating, I didn't have a clue when it came to things like how much food my body actually needed to feel full. That's where the 20 minute rule comes into play. So I'm about a hundred pounds down. I'm right around the halfway mark in my weight loss. And I see this documentary. And there's this doctor explaining that it takes 20 minutes for your stomach to tell your brain it's full. And it was like the world stopped because I realized how much food I can eat in 20 minutes and what that meant when you slammed it into this new little factoid, right? It was possible that I had eaten enough food in the first five minutes and everything after that had been completely unnecessary. But I'd been so busy focusing on the food that I wasn't giving my body a chance to tell me that I was full. And I'd been doing this for years, overeating and ignoring my body's signals for years. So my head exploded and I saw things differently from then on. And this is a huge part of why the second hundred pounds was easier than the first. It wasn't that I felt like all the blame and shame had been shifted away but a big chunk of it went. It wasn't all my fault. And yes, Gladys, I know I was the one overeating, but I didn't know, right? I was waiting to feel full. I was expecting to feel full. And I was looking for something to happen that wasn't physically possible. And I'd been blaming myself for years. This little tidbit allowed me to let myself off the hook just a bit just enough to let some of the guilt slide away. That helped me focus on doing what I needed to do to get the last hundred off. I am 100% the only person responsible for how big I got. Yes, I'd been overweight for most of my life, since I was about eight. Yes, I worked in fast food. Yes, I was on a birth control pill that really wasn't a good fit and I gained 35 pounds in six weeks. Yes, I was young and Sean had a car and an athlete's BMR that let him eat basically whatever he wanted and I tried to keep up gleefully. I love food. Yes, I do feel like my weight snuck up on me and I had no real clue about how big I actually was. I was in denial about my size and about how much I was eating. And to be super specific, I was in denial and genuine ignorance about how many calories were in the food I was eating. I didn't know that either. And to be fair, this was before we had nutrition labeling like we do now. So the information wasn't as accessible as it is now. But I do feel like there's still a general issue in this department, right? Most people don't understand how calories work, how many are in their food, how many they need, how many they burn. 
And I think a lot of that is the way that they've been built up as this big, bad thing. And really, they're neutral. It's just a science thing. They're a unit of measurement, like a centimeter or a gram. There's nothing malevolent about calories. They're not out to get you. It just feels that way. And it's the same deal with this whole 20 minute thing, right? How much food can you take down in the first 20 minutes? Especially if you're hungry and you really like what you're eating. What's your awareness like on this one? Mine was pretty shitty. I just knew that I could eat a lot in 20 minutes. Obviously more than I needed given that I was clocking in over 300 pounds, right? I know I sound tall, but I'm really not. This one is kind of like Greek yogurt from last week, right? I wish I had known about Italian dressing from the very beginning. I got into this one the second time I lost weight when I had to take off the 115 pounds or so that I gained back after keeping off the 200 for you know nine and a half years. Um, Italian dressing doesn't work for everything, but it works for a lot of things. You want the low calorie version, not the low fat version. The low cal is fewer calories for a start and that would usually be the end of it too. But because of the way we're going to use the Italian dressing, you want the low calorie version. You're, we're going to use it to replace a fat. So it's not going to do the job that you need it to. And it's not going to be as satisfying if you go with the low fat version instead. Okay. Italian dressing is the best substitute for butter that I've found when it comes to sauteing proteins or vegetables. It's great on burgers or sandwiches. I especially like it with uh, shrimp and fish, chicken, um, but it's pretty good with pork and beef too. Um, it's a wonderful marinade for pretty much any meat that you can think of. It brightens things and because it's zippy, you need less of the other things that you might add that are higher in calories. So it's a double win. Pretty much the last thing that I use Italian dressing for is salads, but I currently have three bottles of it in my pantry and an open one in the fridge just because I use it for so many other things. But back to marinades for a second. Um, it, it really works great, great as a marinade. And I know that olive oil is lovely. It's also 119 calories a tablespoon. The low calorie Italian dressing is five, five. A, a tablespoon, sorry, five a tablespoon. And I triple checked that number from three different sources because I've been using it for so long that I don't even think about it now. And then I saw my number and I was like, really? Yeah, no, I had it right. Five calories, a tablespoon. So just take a second and add that to your shopping list because you are not going to regret it. Um, the next one is something else that you won't regret either. And I just call it the yarn measurement hack. Um, Keeping track of your progress is critical to your motivation. In a few weeks, we're going to take a look at nine ways to keep yourself going. This tip could have been on that list too. Numbers are great, but they're kind of flat, right? Visuals, tangible visuals like this yarn thing are so powerful. So here's all you have to do. Grab a ball of yarn or a few different ones if you really want to have fun with it and you know use some different colors for different body parts. As you do your measurements, waist, arms, 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 thighs, etc., cut a piece of yarn in the same length. Okay. Next time you do your measurements, cut yourself another piece of yarn using the new measurement. And yeah, a centimeter still counts, even half a centimeter. Um, cut another piece of yarn. Keep them together. Rinse and repeat. And now you've got a way to watch yourself get smaller. It can be really hard to see the changes in yourself especially when they're gradual. But progress is kind of undeniable when you're watching those strings get shorter and shorter. It's very powerful and it's a mindset thing because this weight loss business is happening in your head. It's not about the food. It's about your relationship with food and your ability to keep going hinges on what's happening in your head even more than what's happening on your plate. So you have got to get your head in order. And I know how it sounds, but those pieces of yarn they will help you get your head in order. I also know that it's hard when you're starting out with some pretty long ass pieces of string, right? 338, that's my start, my starting number. I'm not slamming anybody, but losing 30 pounds and losing 100 aren't the same thing. And it's because of the mindset. Um, I think it's probably pretty clear that I'm not a runner, um, but I'm pretty sure that running a marathon and running an ultra marathon require at least slightly different head spaces. And I am so not a runner that when I was doing this, I Googled how long an ultra marathon is, and I'm just gonna get ahead 
of the Gladyses here. I'm using these terms incorrectly. What I'm trying to say is that there are marathons where they run like the 26.2 miles, right? That's the marathon marathon, like the city in Greece with the dude who booked it for 26.2 miles to Athens. The reason why we call it a marathon marathon. And then there are the other ultra marathons, right? Where it's like a hundred miles or they run for three straight days, those ultra marathons. I feel like never having done either to be very clear, but I feel like it takes at least a slightly different perspective to run for a hundred miles than it does to run the 26.2 one, right? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe doing a hundred miles is just like running two and a quarter marathons back to back and it's no big deal. But that's like saying that losing 100 pounds is the same thing as losing 40. Just do it two and a bit times in a row. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. I'm not even sure we would want it to. I needed the skills I built in the first half to carry me through the second. I needed the resilience that I'd built up. You will too. You're also going to need this next favorite tip of mine, which is JLOI. I love eat whatever you want, just less of it because it's an abstract thing and it's a concrete thing. Last week, I was talking about the webinar that's coming up at the start of October. And I told you that when I was planning it out, I wanted to find things to talk about that would be both the easiest to implement and what would make the biggest difference the fastest. That's why Spread Sprinkle Pour was a no-brainer. Just Less Of It is a no-brainer too. And those two concepts combined are definitely the best footing I can give anybody at any point in their weight loss journey. Everybody else focuses on the just less of it part, right? And I'm here for that all day. I've got an Instagram feed and a cookbook filled with ways to help you with the very tangible food part of all of this, because you can't lose weight unless you're in a calorie deficit. And that means you're going to have to have just less of something. But there's that whole other first part, the eat whatever you want part. It's the first part that gets me into trouble. And it's the first part that I think most people, specifically other people doing what I'm doing in the weight loss space, they aren't talking about it and they aren't focusing on it. And that's a huge part of why we have an 85% recidivism rate. You want to keep telling yourself you can eat whatever you want. Stop telling yourself what you can't have. It's not helping. Stop cutting out food groups. Stop cutting out sugar and processed foods. I said what I said, Gladys. I'll say it again. Stop cutting out sugar and processed foods. This is hard enough without making it unnecessarily harder. And that's what you're doing when you buy into the narrative that the only way to lose weight is to eat clean or eat single ingredient foods only. You can lose weight eating nothing but bacon and bubble gum, and they can't argue with me because I'm right. They can argue about how sensible a plan it is, and I've never once said it was a good idea. But they can't argue with the science because it's just true. I had 3,000 calories to play with when I started. Yeah, in a deficit. I was waiting tables full-time, Glads. That burns a lot of calories, and I weighed 338 pounds. It took a lot to keep my body going. That means I could have enjoyed a pound and a half of bacon and still had just over 350 calories left for gum each day. That's a fuckload of gum, but I would have lost weight. Here's a great way to look at this. You know the old riddle trick thing where somebody would go, what weighs more, a pound of bricks or a pound of feathers? That. Our brain hears feathers and bricks and automatically goes, bricks are heavier, but a pound is a pound is a pound. And yeah, a thousand calories of kale is arguably healthier than a thousand calories of bacon. But much like feathers being fluffier than bricks is nice, it still has no bearing on how much a pound is. A thousand calories of a lot of things are probably better for you than a thousand calories of bacon. But that's no more relevant than the fluffiness. It's not the point. Having the bacon you want within your deficit is always going to be a better choice than gagging down the kale you don't want. It's a mindset thing. How long can you choke down the kale before you go on a bacon and bubblegum bender? Isn't it a better idea to have some bacon with the kale so you don't go off the rails? Wouldn't you be better off overall if you're still able to keep going with bacon in a deficit? How long do you think you can gag on that kale? 
And maybe you really like kale and really hate bacon. It's, that's not the point either. Swap in whatever you want here. Quinoa and cheesecake. I don't care. It's not the food. Bacon and bubblegum is just shorthand. It's deliberately shocking shorthand. The Gladyses lose their ever-loving minds every time I say it. And it sets some of you free. You have been lied to on so many fronts. If you're new here, you might not know about my issue with the whole diet and exercise myth, and I'm not going to go into it right now, uh, but I have decided it's something we're going to come back to today. Right now, I will say you have been lied to. And if you're new here, you also might not know that I don't often lay into the fat bias thing, but I really do believe that some of the lies we've been told are because of fat phobia and flat out discrimination against the obese. Losing weight sucks, but it doesn't have to be punitive. You don't deserve to be punished for being fat. That's horseshit. You don't deserve to be punished with exercise and you don't deserve to be punished with what you eat either. You don't have to suffer which brings us very nicely to the second half of one of my favorite turns of phrase, just less of it, right? Eat whatever you want, just less of it, slightly less. Small incremental changes are the way to go. And if you were here last week when I was talking about spread, sprinkle, pour, you'll know that I really wished I had a system, something simple, straightforward, and easy to use that would have helped me to make those small incremental changes without feeling like I was fumbling around in the dark. So I made one for you. And I'm going to double down on the promise that I made last week. It's always going to be free. I know my team is cringing. I know they would prefer I either say, you know, not that at all, or at the very least, I just wait until after the webinar that I'm supposed to be signing up for people, people up for it instead. Um, but I get anxiety just as much as I get how important FOMO is from a marketing perspective. And I don't want to make you feel like that. So yes, I will be uh, debuting, I guess because uh, I can't think of a better word, I'll be showing you the forms, the system that I made to help you with small incremental changes so that you can implement things like spread, sprinkle, pour, and JLOI. I'm going to be showing them and explaining how to use them and then sending them to everybody who comes to the webinar. But I'm also going to find a way to get them to anybody else who wants them to. And the webinar is free, so it's only fair that the forms are too forever. I'm, I'm not going to put them behind a paywall. Um, and those of you who are already in the program, you're just going to automatically get them. They're just going to come straight to you. Um, something that I'm not going into in the webinar, and I talked about this a little while ago, I think it was in the first 20 episodes. Um, so I want to talk just for a minute or two about the difference I mean between small and incremental because I've been accused of being deliberately redundant here and I most definitely am not. You want to be making small changes incrementally. So you want to make little changes to what you're eating and you want to be making those changes a little bit at a time. Changing everything all at once can feel very exciting, um, but it's not a great long-term strategy. It, it just isn't. Have I, I've mentioned the 85% recidivism rate, right? Um, small changes. Don't try to go from a cup and a half of salad dressing to a couple of tablespoons. It's not going to work. Not for long. The imagery I like to conjure up the most with this one is swimming, okay? If you're trying to teach someone how to swim, right, it seems very unlikely to me that you're going to load them onto a boat drive a few miles offshore and chuck them in. I'm betting that you're going to start on the beach. You know, let them walk in gradually, start slowly, get comfortable and confident in the water. I feel this way about weight loss too. Going through your kitchen tomorrow and throwing out all of the big bad foods is the same thing as loading that poor non-swimmer into a boat and throwing them out, right? Why would you do that when there's a perfectly good beach right over there? I'll give you that it's more exciting, but what about safety first and just common fucking sense? It's the same thing with losing weight. You can switch to whole foods tomorrow, start cooking everything from scratch and swearing off sugar and seed oils. You definitely can. 
You could walk away from carbs or start trying to eat your body weight in protein every day. All certainly possible. But why would you do that when there's a perfectly good beach right over there? Bacon and bubblegum, people. The science doesn't lie. So long as you're in a calorie deficit, it doesn't matter. And the best way to get yourself into that deficit is in a way that you're going to be able to keep doing. It has to be sustainable. Small incremental changes pave the road to sustainability. Instead of throwing out all your food tomorrow, start making small incremental changes. Go from the cup and a half of salad dressing, which is 24 tablespoons, cut that back to 22. You're not even going to notice. But if you're a fan of ranch or Thousand Islands like I am, you also just cut up to 240 calories that you didn't notice. So there's that. Then cut it to 20, then 18. You see where I'm going with this. And I'm not accusing anybody of using a cup and a half of salad dressing. That is a true story from my very own life. I really liked massive cob style salads, you know, the ones with like the cheese and the ham and the boiled eggs. I also really obviously enjoy salad dressing, which is a pour, by the way. And that's exactly how I did it, right? I realized how much I was using. I nearly passed out. And then I just cut back a little bit at a time. So I know how unlikely it is that your thing is salad dressing. How much cheese are you using on pizza? How much butter or mayo is on your sandwiches? You guys are in 106 countries. So I'm just going to keep using examples from my journey. I kind of feel like it would be disingenuous for me to try and guess at your high calorie, you know, calorie dense foods that you're eating to excess. That's not my lane. So whatever it is for you, whatever your salad dressing is, Small incremental changes are the way out. You're fighting a war on many fronts. So instead of taking on just one of them, make little changes on a whole bunch of fronts, but do it over time. Only weigh yourself once a week. I've said this one a few times now, and I'm going to keep saying it. Anything more than once a week and you'll make yourself crazy. Anything less and you won't be aware enough to stay on top of things. The scale is going to swing. I can be up to three pounds heavier at night than I am in the morning. Weighing yourself every day or every other day or every three days or a couple of times a day, that is a mindset minefield. I know exactly how amazing it feels to get on that scale and see a lower number. I also know how devastating it feels when it goes up or it stays the same. You want this to be gradual. You want it to be sustainable. Getting on the scale every day when you're losing weight isn't sustainable. It isn't going to build you up. It's only going to break you down. It isn't possible for you to see a lower number every time you get on the scale. It's not possible. You're going to be setting yourself up for disappointment most of the time. And that's not good for your mindset at all. The last thing you want to be is discouraged. You don't want to feel disappointed in yourself. So don't torture yourself with the scale. This might get me into trouble, but I'm saying it anyway. Some of us use the torture as a distraction from the real issue. So if you're all caught up in what the scale says, um, in particular caught up in the feelings that come up when you see a number that you don't like, you don't have the mental time or space to deal with other feelings. Those scale feelings are taking up all the space in the room and not giving anything else a chance to come up. You have an issue with your relationship with food, but you're behaving and thinking and feeling as though you have an issue with your relationship with the scale. And that's not possible. The scale is an inanimate object. Your relationship with food is very much a living and breathing thing. It's a huge part of who you are. And I get that a lot of us have a relationship with our scales or we feel like we do, but that's not the real issue. It's a symptom, not the illness. The root issue is your relationship with food. If that house was in order, the scale wouldn't be an issue at all. No backward, only forward was my motto when I was sick. The whole almost dying thing. Round one, anyway. The, the big one. The airlift, the crash C-section, the necrotizing pancreatitis, the Ogilvy syndrome, plus a whack of other stuff. That time I almost died. No backward, only forward wasn't my motto in the beginning. 
it took a good while for me to get there, mostly because I was so sick at the beginning that there was no thinking about anything other than being sick. And that included dying, by the way. I wasn't thinking about it. I was way too busy being sick to even consider dying. And I had so much other stuff going on, right? Like three boys under three and pain, um, the kind that comes along with things like necrotizing pancreatitis. I'm not a doctor uh, and I'm not an expert on pain, but I've dealt with a few things. I did, um, I did three and a half years of spinal injections after a car accident. I had a fingernail ripped off with a pair of tweezers when I smashed it in a window uh, as a teenager. That was my baseline for extreme pain for a while. Then my pancreas decided it was his turn to shine. And there is nothing like that that I know. The pain in my abdomen as my pancreas died and liquefied, which is basically what necrotizing pancreas is, pancreatitis is, um, was so extreme that I have no memory of any pain at all from my C-section, no memory of my incision being an issue or it even registering with me at all. My pancreas was louder. There's just nothing like it. Now, since then, my kidneys have decided to throw their hats in the ring. That was last summer. A year ago, last week, I had my second surgery in a month and kidney pain was not fun, not fun at all. The year before that, I was hospitalized with a pancreatic pseudocyst, which was a holdover from the whole almost dying thing. Um, and it wins. So far, the pancreas always wins. And I talk about this, but the truth for me very much still is there's no backward, only forward. I am weirdly grateful for my organs. Uh, what's gone is gone and what's done is done. I don't mean that I think it's weird to be grateful. I, I mean, I'm grateful in weird ways. Like I have this thing where I only talk about what my organs can do and how amazing I think that is because it really is amazing. The weird part is maybe how I will take any opportunity to talk about how wonderful I think they are. I don't want, I really, I don't want any negativity about them at all. But for me, that's all part of there's no backward, only forward. It doesn't matter what happened or how much pancreas I have left or how incredible it is that the part that I do have left has enough beta cells to make the insulin I need so long as I'm careful in getting my steps in. There is no alternative but to move forward with what I have. And I know that's literally the case, but I'm talking about a mindset choice. Obviously, I'm only ever going to have the absolutely brilliant piece of pancreas that I have. It's not a liver or a lizard's tail. It's never growing back on its own. But I could make mindset choices that would make my life one hell of a whole lot harder. But why? To what end? If it doesn't serve me, I try to let it go. These stories, these pieces of myself that I share, they serve me because they serve you. They're a vehicle for me to get my message out there. Some of it I can share and I'm pretty detached from it or not detached maybe, but I've processed it to the point that I can talk about it. Other stuff is harder to talk about um, because I'm still working my way through it. Right now I want I want to take a second. I want to thank my nurse flamingos and you know who you are. I can't tell you how much each and every one of you mean to me. Um, your messages have found me in some really tough moments and they mean the absolute world to me. Um, I can't thank you enough for uh, your understanding and your encouragement. You guys, and you're basically complete strangers from all over the world right? You understand things um, in ways that some of the closest people to me can't, which isn't their fault or anything like that. It's just when you reach out and I know how deeply you get it and you're taking the time to send me a message, it's just being seen on a whole other level. And it's really hard for me to find words for this. Um, I sobbed my whole way through <laughs> writing this down. Um, I've talked about some of my nurses in other episodes and I want to try and talk about them more, but they're some of the hardest things for me to talk about because the bond that forms when someone is literally taking care of every facet of your existence, right? When someone's bathing you and treating your yeast infections and doing your injections and flushing your lines and all the things that you never even think about until you physically can't do any of them for yourself. The people who do all of that and still see you as a person who keep pulling for you when you're not sure if you can do it for yourself and nobody is sure you're going to make it. 
the nurses who held my hand, who pushed me when I needed it um, and saw in my eyes when I was about to break, the ones whose eyes welled up with tears when they saw the size of my heparin doses and the size of the cysts on my arms and my thighs from the previous injections. Um, and just in case uh, any of my nurse flamingos are listening now, I will, uh, I'll confide that they weren't doing my heparin shots in my abdomen because I wouldn't let them. That's all. It wasn't, it was nobody's fault or mis it was me. Um, I know that's where they, those shots get done a lot, but I wouldn't let them do any of my injections in my abdomen, not even my insulin shots. My refusal was a psychological combo pack for me of having drains in each side and a chest tube combined with my C-section wound combined with seeing diabetics in my family injecting their abdomens as a kid. I tried to be reasonable, but I, I just couldn't do it. So they were doing the shots in my upper arms and my thighs, but months of daily shots, usually more than one a day, uh, and my arms and legs looked like grapes. So I'm sorry to everybody else, all of my non-nurse flamingos. Um, it's just that I get a lot of messages of support from nurses, and it's clearly an emotional topic for me. Um, and I'm pretty sure that I did just mention a minute ago that there, there are still uh, some things that I am still working my way through. I had nurses who knew about my no backward, only forward mantra because I had nurses who were with me for months at a time and they knew everything. Uh, but no backward, only forward was something that came out with psych, which is another topic I don't really like going into. Uh, I'm self-conscious about it because I feel um, and I, I, I feel like I have to speak about myself in a certain way that makes me uncomfortable. I feel like a bit of an asshole. Um, but I saw psych a lot, like a lot, a lot. Uh, they were beyond aware that my physical health hinged on my mental health too. And I was in a super shitty situation, um, which was how they explained my depression to me. It was situational. Any person in my position would be clinically depressed, full stop. And I was, I was the most depressed I've ever been in my entire life. And that's coming from someone who has been diagnosed with treatment resistant depression. Um, see, asshole, listen to me bragging about my depression. Um, so because mental health really matters and mine was precarious at best, I saw a psych a lot. And they were the first people to tell me that given the nature of the situation, there wasn't much they could do for me other than listen. Uh, there was no point making promises that everybody knew they couldn't keep. There was no glossing over that I was separated from my children and my body was in extremely dire waters. Focusing on a sunshiny future wasn't in the cards when I was still trying to get through to the next morning. And I had very long stretches where I had no concept of time, which made knowing if it was another morning difficult. Uh, the future was too far away. What was happening in the minute to minute made it impossible to see. What had happened to me suffered a similar fate, right? Um, there was no point focusing on what I'd lost, on what I'd been through and what it was costing Sean and the boys. Um, nothing could change, nothing could change it. And the minute to minute was so hard to get through, causing myself the emotional pain that came with focusing on all of that was so, so overwhelming that I couldn't handle it physically. And hysterics are a pretty bad idea when you're riddled with infection, burning a high fever and full of the tubes and stuff that I was talking about earlier. Um, when I get hysterical, I also tend to vomit, which is an exhausting physical ordeal when there's been nothing in your stomach for weeks on end. Um, puking is a lot more tiring than it seems when you're doing it for up to 15 minutes at a time, up to a dozen or more times a day. Um, but I kept going, I kept trying and sometimes I had a good attitude about it. Sometimes I didn't, but I kept trying. And Psych kept asking me how I kept trying. And I told them, there's no backward, only forward. It, it wasn't even about letting anything go. That's not what happened. It was about having a single-minded focus. I didn't let it go. The pain and the rage were all still there. The desperation and the deep, deep sadness I kept all of those. I just didn't let myself think about them. I did what I had to do so I could get through the situation I was in. From my perspective, the only choice I had was to keep going. 
when it comes to significant weight loss, there's no backward, only forward to. I get that losing weight isn't the same thing as fighting for your life in the minute to minute and the day to day. But when you look at things from a broader perspective, yeah, you kind of are fighting for your life. And yeah, how you ended up in the body you're in is important, but it's what you do moving forward that's going to matter. Looking back and staying trapped in the patterns and the feelings that got you here isn't really conducive to moving forward. It's very hard to ride a bike when you're looking over your shoulder. I know there are massive feelings that come along with obesity. Guilt, shame, blame, self-loathing, they're not serving you. You don't have to let them go. It'd be great, but I don't think it's that simple. I also think it's all well and good to say that you need to just forgive yourself and accept yourself. That's fine too, but it's going to be a hell of a whole lot easier to do if you're actively doing something to improve things for yourself. I'm not saying it's automatic. I'm saying it's easier to do. Trying to improve your self-esteem and your self-worth to improve your confidence and your motivation before you lose weight is cart before the horse stuff. Keep moving forward. You can't go back anyway. There's no backward. Only forward. Okay, so I love potatoes. Just in the spirit of full disclosure, at no point in my journey did I give them up. But I feel like they're having a reputation crisis, and it's not fair. And I'm talking now about standard potatoes, russets, Yukon golds, those ones with the lovely red skin. I'm not talking about sweet potatoes. They are nutritionally stunning, but they're also not my favorite, and they're not the kind of potato I'm talking about now. Okay, so yeah, potatoes, they're a starchy veg, right? They're a big, bad carbohydrate. Here's what the keto and carnivore crowd aren't talking about, though. While they're out there telling everybody about how amazing protein is when it comes to weight loss, and it is pretty great, they're also slamming the mighty potato and pretending that it isn't number one on the Sadie Index. Mm, yeah, nothing keeps you feeling as full for as long as the humble potato. Nothing. Potatoes kick the ever-loving snot out of the competition, scoring a 323. That's almost double beef, by the way, which comes in with a 176. The index uses white bread as a baseline, and it has a score of 100. That means that the same amount of potato is more than three times more satisfying than the bread. Yeah, I know potatoes are a carb, okay? There's nothing wrong with carbs. I know they're about 80 calories per 100 gram, right? which is just about half the calories of the same amount of beef. Just saying. We demonize food without understanding how calories work, and we end up with thousands of people telling millions of other people that eating foods like potatoes is a bad idea if you want to lose weight. That is insane. The more satisfying a food is, the less likely you are to overeat later. The less likely you are to be dealing with constant food noise if you're not feeling constantly hungry. So don't give up your potatoes. Pair them with Greek yogurt instead of sour cream. Use butter-flavored popcorn sprinkles instead of actual butter. Chop them up, boil them, throw some salt, pepper, and garlic powder at them, and then chuck them in your air fryer. They go all crispy and lovely. Lots of options. This favorite tip is a bit of an oldie but a goodie, and I did tease it earlier on, but don't exercise to lose weight, right? I'm not going to completely go off on this one. I have whole episodes where I do nothing but go off on this one. True story, episode nine and episode 40 are exclusively about my feelings on this one. And there's probably at least a half a dozen segments on it scattered through the Ask Whatever episodes. But I have feelings about this one. Big feelings. I'm sick of the fear mongering and the self righteous bullshit attitude. I'm sick of arguing about math and science. I'm sick of the way, way too pervasive train of thought that fat people should be punished, that we need to earn our thinner bodies and prove that we deserve them. Horseshit. Everybody deserves to be healthy. It's just more shame and it's got to go. I keep pushing back, and I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but I'm just one voice in a sea of garbage that's been floating around for decades and has been generally accepted as the truth, as the reality of the situation, and it's neither. People get very angry with me when I say I lost 201 pounds with zero exercise. It offends them. It brands me as lazy, 
ignorant. I've been called lazy and stupid. I've also been told that I'm lying. Yeah, none of those things are true. I did lose 201 pounds with zero exercise on purpose. I hated exercise. Yeah, I really hated weighing over 300 pounds. Not as much as I hated exercise, though. If diet and exercise were the only ways to lose weight, that was it. Those two things. That was the only choice I had together, right? I knew I wasn't going to make it, right? I was meeting myself where I was and understanding my own capacities and capabilities. I mean, I could have lied to myself and said I was going to lose the weight by hitting the gym and learning to run. But if I had, I'd still be fat. Actually, I would definitely be dead if I hadn't lost the weight. But you know what I mean, what I'm saying, right? If I'd had to lose the weight with exercise, I wouldn't have lost the weight. Now, what I didn't understand back then was the science. I didn't know how few calories exercise actually burns or the entitlement mindset that it can breed. I just knew I couldn't do it. I knew there had to be another way. The insistence on exercise is a huge barrier for a lot of people. Obviously, not everybody. There are amazing people out there who have lost massive amounts of weight through the classic diet and exercise model. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying it's not for everybody. And that's fine because exercise isn't necessary for weight loss. You do not have to exercise to lose weight. Meet yourself where you are and get to a calorie deficit. And if you want to hear me ranting more on this one, just check out episode 9 or 40 or both. The 3A way is last, but not because it's my least favorite. It's last because if you take nothing else away from today, I hope that it's the 3A way. When you ask me how to change your relationship with food, the 3A way is the long and the short answer. And for a much longer answer than I'm about to give you, there's episode 12, which is an overview I did way back. Um, but I'm actually talking about this all the time. If we look at the 3A way broadly, and we just apply it to your relationship with food as though that were a singular thing. Um, you can't change your relationship with food until you are aware of what it actually is. You need to acknowledge the issues that you see when you start digging into your relationship with food, and you need to hold yourself accountable to the changes you need to make to repair your relationship with food. That's the short answer. It takes me 53 weeks of video instruction and more than 800 pages of workbooks to give you the long answer. And I'm not saying that as a pitch for the program. I'm saying that to illustrate the scope of just how big the answer is. But I believe with everything I have that the 3A way is the way out. Whether you're doing it with me here on the podcast or my other social media or with me in the program, it's the way out. It's the underlying framework for basically everything I talk about, the whole underpinning. At any given moment, I'm trying to do one of those three things. Make you aware of something, help you to acknowledge something, or show you how to find your way to accountability. That's all I'm doing. Your relationship with food isn't a singular thing. It's a whole bunch of things. In the program, I break it down using a classic framework. You look at your relationship with food through the lens of what you're eating, who you're eating it with, even if it's only yourself, when you eat, where you eat, and how you eat because it's never just one thing. It's complicated. Your relationship with food is like a big knot. You've got to look at the individual strands so that you can untangle it. Pulling at a knot erratically isn't usually a great strategy. Whatever you're trying to tackle, whether it's trying to incorporate more water or figure out a way to stop yourself from gorging after visits with your sister-in-law or figure out the best time of day to eat so that you feel the most satisfied overall or to understand why you choose certain foods to comfort yourself versus the foods that you choose to cope or to reward yourself. It doesn't matter what you're trying to figure out, 3A way. You can't change what you can't see. You have to make yourself as aware as you can of those individual strands, of the pieces that make up your relationship with food. But awareness isn't enough. We see things about ourselves and the patterns in our lives all the time and then do everything we can to not think of whatever it is that we just figured out. You have to acknowledge what you see. It's a mindset thing. And it makes pulling off the third A so much easier. It's accountability. 
that's the part where you have to do something about it. Whether it's buying a fancy new water bottle or setting some new boundaries with your Gladys of a sister-in-law or incrementally implementing a new eating window or actively looking for patterns in the choices you're making with your comfort reward and cope foods. There's a lot going on with accountability too. Weight loss is complicated. I wish it was just the food, but it isn't. The toxic diet industry makes billions convincing people it's about the food. We all wish it was a food thing. And I'm not saying it's not part of the solution, but I think the 85% recidivism rate is all the proof in the pudding that anybody needs to understand that it's not a standalone solution. You need more. I want to help with that as much as I can. Right now, you can grab a copy of my free guide, which are 11 things that you can do immediately today that are going to make a big difference. There's Disruptor, my weight loss workbook on Amazon. The webinar is coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm going deep into Spread, Sprinkle, Pour and JLOI, and I'm giving away the simple system I developed to help you implement both of those things. Plus, we're going to have a chance to chat in real time for the first time. If you're looking to go all in, there's the program. And you can get more information on all of this stuff on my website, disruptingobesity.com. Next week is our monthly Ask Whatever. And I'm doing something completely different again. You know how I have my spreadsheet with all the questions that you guys send me? Well, I'm making myself answer the questions I've been avoiding. Eight of them. Plus a good for you, Gladys. Because it just wouldn't be the same without her. Thank you for joining me. Keep trying. Keep tracking. Don't be intimidated. And don't give up. You've totally got this. Thank you for listening to Disrupting Obesity with Charlotte Skeynes. If you know it's time to take back control, lose the weight and keep it off, reach out to me privately with a direct message on Instagram that says ready so you can start disrupting obesity.